Good morning, London. How's everybody? Are you excited? Yes. Looking forward to the day ahead of you? I'm too. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming in. Uh, I'm hoping this is going to be a very fun-filled, exciting, and interactive session. So no one is going to be silent and on mute, but really engaging. That's what we want here. Do you all agree? Yes. Fantastic. So, so thanks, Scott, for that uh, really overwhelming intro. So, so I'm not as great as Scott mentioned, uh, just to keep it very open between us. So what I'll do here is uh, talk around the topic we have here. It's mostly around AI. Uh, so what is happening is AI is transforming most of our industries. The industries, organizations, society, companies that we see uh, is all transforming in a way which uh, is all enabled with data science, enabled with something called cloud technologies, enabled with some of the things like Internet of Things. What I'll do here is give you a quick context of what I want to cover here. So who likes to fill fuel in their car? Almost nobody. I'm, I'm also one of them. So literally when you think of going to a fuel station to fill up fuel, it, it's boring. Who wants to do that, right? No one wants to go to a fuel station to fill up boring fuel. So what we are trying to do is bring in things like AI, data science, and so on and so forth to make it exciting for people. And that's what I'm going to talk here. I'm not going to talk just about technology. I'm going to talk about that because that's how you make it real. But I'll talk to you about what is the context? What are we trying to do here? How are we trying to make life more exciting? Companies may be more profitable and organizations move to something we call as net zero, which means we want this world to have lower emissions and more sustainable supply chains. So that's what the quick background is. So I'll go to the next slide, uh, which is going to be more of a video to actually show you something in terms of uh, what customers are asking for, uh, and I don't want to steal the thunder of the video, uh, some sort of a research my team here has done in terms of what existing fuel companies do currently. And third is how can we transform that experience using things like data science, AI, and so on. Here at CGI, we have been reimagining the future fuel retail experience. We have been looking at how customer demands are changing and how customer-centric loyalty is key for fuel retailers preparing for the future. We conducted a short survey to understand the change in customer demands. Goods at the forecourt shops were priced far too highly. Current loyalty programs didn't engage the majority of customers. And there is a drop in footfall to fuel stations. Brand loyalty was simply not encouraging customers to visit. Customers did recognise fuel stations as an ideal place they would pick up goods from, but the fuel station car wash wasn't something they would consider. Supermarket fuel stations were becoming the customer's favourite choice. Clearly, to keep fuel stations relevant, there is a need for change. Through the development of our solution, we conduct research the industry to see how fuel retailers are using digital platforms to communicate with their customers. The range of apps available in the industry are generally user-friendly with good station finder functionality. App features can be a bit disconnected and so can lead to a fragmented journey for the customer. Rewards are not personalised to the customer and there seems little ability to upsell or cross-sell, thus missing an opportunity to grow the customer's basket size. Within the apps, there is only limited support for non-fuel, in particular click and collect, and so there is scope to extend functionality to give more primary reasons for the customer to visit the fuel station. Within our demo, we plan to showcase areas where we can address some of these gaps. Our approach in the demo is to consider a couple of personas and set up scenarios in how they can interact with the various components of our solution. Consider Julia first. She's an existing customer and enjoys fresh and healthy food, but as she's often under time pressures, she also regularly buys premium convenience food. As a brand, letting her know about products and offers using SMS and push notifications will ensure she remains a loyal customer. When Julie launches the site, we can see the fresh food personalization for what we understand from her as a customer, including giving easy access to her most popular categories, groceries, breakfast and fruit in this case. 
On a typical day, she'll add a number of items to her basket. For example, an M&S product, and bread. The basket here shows what she's added, and below a number of recommendations based on Julia's basket and the insight we have on her. Complimentary products in butter and milk, and grocery delivery subscription, as we know she buys a lot of groceries, so they prefer a delivery service. When she visits the... So I'll stop it here. So this was just to give you a very quick context of, uh, uh, before I jump into the industry challenge, in terms of what's happening in terms of customer preferences. People don't want to necessarily interact with the same boring fuel stations of the past. People want something which is more exciting, more engaging. A uh, couple of other points are more and more people are moving towards electric vehicles. So what does it mean? Does it mean that people will stop going to those fuel stations which are boring anyhow? The second thing is people are more and more conscious about the environment. Does it mean as we move towards electric vehicles, would the relevance of these four quotes, as they are called, cease to exist? And to give you an example, right? Some of the largest energy companies in the world have around 17,000 to 20,000 of these four quotes where you fill fuel. That's a huge amount of real estate that exists. So what do they need to do now? And that's what we're trying to uh, help them in. So very quickly, I'll take you through the industry context. So, so before we get into technology, right, we want to understand what happens at something called a macro level, which is at a very high level. And the second aspect is what happens at a micro level, which means what happens that can impact an individual company, individual society, as well as individual cities. So at a macro level, right, the first part is uh, uh, carbon neutrality. So more and more of the focus of societies, governments, individuals is, how do I move to a world that's greener, that has, let's say, lower carbon emissions, lower sulfur dioxide emissions, methane emissions, and so on and so forth which deplete those own layers. So that's the first macro challenge. And these companies that have been exploring oil and gas for 50 plus years and make a ton, out, ton of money out of that, what would they now do when more and more customers say, I don't want to use a fossil fueled car? So that's the first challenge in terms of what happens when customers, individuals, societies move towards a defossilized future, which means a future where there's no oil and gas. The second challenge is electrification. Most of you will know, right, by 2030, in UK at least, elect, uh, petrol and diesel car sales are going to be banned in terms of the new cars. By 2035, it'll impact hybrids as well. So what does it mean? Slowly, more and more people, when they think of buying a new car, they're going to think, why not I buy electric car? It's, it's a good idea from an individual point of view, but what is the impact of that on a macro level to the large oil and gas companies? It, it suddenly means that you will not be necessarily going to the fuel stations that exist, 17,000 for just one company that uh, uh, I was mentioning earlier. The second impact is you could be even ch charging it at home. You don't even have to go outside. You could have a charger at home and charge it home. What does it mean then in terms of impact to these big companies? The third is regulations. There is a big push in terms of individual societies owning their own data. So as individuals, you want ownership of your data. There are regulations like GDPR, uh, which is prevalent across Europe, which, which mandates what data can be accessed by organizations, societies, in terms of using it for their own advantage. So there is a lot of things they have to navigate in terms of ensuring that they are still compliant from a regulations and user privacy point of view. So these are big macro challenges. And I'm not just going to give you the challenges and leave you there, I'll explain to you what it means in terms of what can be done to solve the challenges, still become sustainable and still move towards a cleaner energy future. The next very quick thing is around micro. So what is impacting these large companies at a micro level is loyalty. How many of you are loyal to your current fuel provider? Raise your hand, please. It's not surprising, almost none of you have raised your hands. So our survey said that almost just 3% of the people who fill fuel ever are loyal to their uh, fuels, fuel provider. And that's a big micro challenge. What does it mean for these companies? 
in terms of how can they incentivize uh, customers to come to them to buy services from them. So that's a micro challenge. The second is in terms of what happens to these four courts in the future. So this is a good example, right, on in terms of what a four court could look like if nothing is done. And there are, there are hundreds of thousands of them globally and individual large company has 17,000 of them. What happens to them once people don't go somewhere to fill fuel? That, that's what could happen. And that means a lot of real estate capital is stuck there. And there has to be something that needs to be done to make it more productive. And the last part is the margins. What do you think is the typical margin of a, a fuel retailing company? Like any of these large petrol stations, diesel stations you see, what is the margin do you think these companies make on that? There's no right or wrong answer, so feel free to go for it. What do you think? In terms of percentage, is it greater than 10%, greater than 20%, less than 5%? Exactly. So I hear 3, 10, right? So these are all right numbers. So there are two things. One is called gross margin, which is cost of, uh, cost of sales minus cost of goods sold. And that's around a 10%, which doesn't include your cost of uh, manpower, cost of, uh, let's say, financing the particular investment and so on. But if you consider all these other costs as well, the margins, which are called the net margins then, go to almost 2 to 3%. So they make almost razor thing margins because of competition. That already is one of the big micro challenges. So what do we do differently, right? So companies can do two things. One is called defensive strategy. So what is a defensive strategy? Defensive strategy is you are a large incumbent. Like you are a company that does something for let's say 50 years, 100 years, and you want to now defend your position. That's a defensive strategy, which means there are new companies that are entering these markets, new startups, new technology-led companies. What do you do to not only survive, but possibly grow? And I'll talk about what, what they're doing at the moment. The second is offensive strategy. So these are mostly companies that are the small, nimble companies, like the Ubers. So they don't necessarily have any assets themselves. They have a great idea. They have created a platform, and they have got an ecosystem engaged in that platform. So that's an offensive strategy. A similar example could be Amazon, which came up with an offensive strategy and is actually attacking the brick and mortar shops that you see. And I'll talk of a few examples later, which are real examples where still the brick and mortar can come back and fight, as well as some of the offensive strategy of new incumbent, new startups that are still attacking that market. And we'll talk about both of that. And I'll talk about how they are actually doing that as well. And all of that is to convert uh, people who are not necessarily loyal to these companies to become more loyal. And that's the idea. And, and research, and a few of my team members can share is, when you convert people who just visit your, let's say, store or your facility and buy, versus who are loyal to you and buy, the, the revenues double when, when the a particular visitor is converted to something like a customer. So that's, that's a big, big revenue driver for these companies. And, and we'll talk a bit around how you could use AI, data science, and so on to enable all of that. And along with that, focus on sustainability and cleaner energy as well. So very high, uh, at a very high level, the, the key solutions you may want to think about is surely omni-channel. So typically what used to happen is if you go to a particular uh, physical brick and mortar place. So here I'm talking of a fuel station uh, where you would physically go and fill. The second example could be a bank where traditionally, I think 10 years back, you used to go there to visit the banker, understand what is your balance, maybe invest in a new savings account. So that's what used to happen in the past. But what's happened with digitalization and AI, uh, there is bigger value in something called omni-channel. And when I say omni-channel, it is taking advantage of your typical brick and mortar type of stores you have, plus adding to it an e-commerce platform, which means you're able to partner with a customer or a supplier or an ecosystem member on a 24 by 7 basis. So you're not restricting yourself in terms of when a particular customer visits, but you can actually provide them very personalized propositions. I can understand what this lady likes 
based on her social behavior, based on her preferences she would have shared, along with data from weather, data from specific geo uh, uh, sensors, as well as data from something we call as geolocation to identify what are the things that may best uh, suit that particular individual to make a purchase decision. So that's, that's omni-channel along with data science and the IIoT or the uh, Internet of Thing angle is around uh, things like uh, uh, cameras and, and geolocation monitoring systems that actually identify what's happening in a particular area, what are people let's say watching on television and providing them propositions that actually align to what they are looking. And, and we call something called a hyper personalization here, where you are able to give people things that they never even thought about it. And that's one of the angles here. So, so when we are talking of transforming the, the current brick and mortar into a future digital uh, uh, venue, it's all about using data science, IoT, omni-channel, along with things like cloud and location data to come up with propositions to them which they never even thought they wanted and, and make it more of an exciting place for them to visit. So that's uh, what the solutions are and, and typically it will help them increase revenues which, which we already spoke about. Uh, it will make these destinations into a venue of engagement. So it will not be in the future you go there to just fill fuel you may or may not even go there to fill fuel because you may already have filled fuel at home. You may actually go there to do something completely different, which could be in terms of buying new services. It could be even going there to understand what is going to come out. So it's going to be a... So I'm going tomorrow morning to this particular, let's say, uh, uh, fuel station or convenience store to find out what I'm going to get recommended, which, which I think is going to be a different level of engagement, where you would just go there thinking, okay, when I go there, I'm going to get excited. And that's what the, the future may look like. And it's all about reducing working capital, as we said, because what happens is once the entire supply chain becomes digital, you would be able to predict what type of goods will get sold at what time and you will automatically have your suppliers lined up and that's a concept we call as hyper automation as well and that's going to completely transform the cost of inventory, the cost of working capital and, and give you as a customer the product when you need it and where you need it and I'll talk about a specific, specific Alibaba example which exactly is what, what they are doing. Uh, which has not reached Europe, but, but it's going to reach very soon. And the last is regulations, which, which, is, uh, which is good. So this is my last slide. So here what I want to share with you is what's happening in real world, right? So how many of you know about Alibaba? It's, it's impressive, right? Almost many of you know about what is Alibaba, which is, which is great. When do you think Alibaba was created? Don't worry, there's no right, wrong answer, so. Five years ago. So there's a gentleman, I'm not naming who, but someone mentioned Alibaba was created five years ago. Any other answers? It's just to create an engagement, really. It's, it's, sorry? Ten years. ten years ago, right? So there are answers. People think Alibaba was created five years, ten years, but Alibaba actually was created in 1999. That's impressive, right? So, so company created in China, and because it's China, it was very, very focused within that country. So most of you and me were not aware of what's happening. And even now, you'll not believe it. The amount of innovations happening inside China, we are not even aware. And, and I'll share some of these things with you right now. So this is a company that is extremely innovative, started in 1990s, 1999 to be precise. Uh, and, and most of you know Jack Ma, Jack Ma right? So he's, he's suddenly in the last five years and 10 years, you're right become famous, but it's been there for ages now. So what that company is doing is, first of all, it, it controls 80% of China's online market, which is huge. So China as a country itself is huge, controlling 80% of their online market itself is huge. And that's how I think more and more people started realizing that there are these large companies that are doing something different. So what are they doing something different, right? 
Let me give you an example. So they have a store, uh, a chain of stores called the Hema stores. You may not even have heard of that name. It's called a Hema store. And there are a few thousands of them in China. What do they do? They do something that is, we call breaking the bounds of innovation. So what they have done is, these are like small local stores that you would see in UK. So if you go down this street, you may see some lo small local stores, right? So what they have done is, they have completely digitalized these stores. So you enter these stores, you could be able to actually, with a mobile phone, click on any product there, understand from where that product was sourced using, let's say, a QR code in this example, understand what are the particular uh, uh, properties of that product, you could click on it, you could buy it, and it will get delivered to your house. So that's how they are actually progressing forward. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is, in many of these Alibaba stores, um, and, and I'm maybe starting with the ladies here, uh, you could actually go to any of those digital displays. You could try out any makeup you want without the hassle, right? So many of you would think that when I go to, let's say, a Debenham Superstore or wherever, I can try maybe two or three things and, and it's, it's too much, right? I can't be trying a 100 lipsticks because it's a lot of work. Versus here, on a digital display, you could actually simulate hundreds of variations of, let's say, cosmetics, lipsticks, whatever, and with a click of a button, you can buy it and it gets delivered to your house as well. So that's, that's what they're doing at the moment. And, and that's something that is going to slowly catch up in terms of the way how data science and AI will understand what you would like, recommend things to you, and give it to you in a way which physically wouldn't have been possible before. So that's uh, an amazing story of Alibaba, and, and you would see more and more of that happening in mainstream Europe as well. The second is Amazon, right? Who knows Amazon? Pretty much everyone, right? So everyone knows Amazon. And, and, and that's the second example that is very, very innovative. And, and if you think about it, right? So when Amazon was started, and I, and I remember I was in my MBA days at that time. This, I, I can't reveal my age, but it's like 25 years or something like that. And I actually wrote a thesis on Amazon. And at that time, I did not even think Amazon was some great big company. It was a project I was doing on e-commerce. And that's what typically Amazon was. And, and my project was all about uh, e-books. It, it was all about uh, selling books online. And, and, and that's where uh, uh, it all started. But if you see how it transformed, right? It, it, it actually collected all the customer data. It collected all the connections that it had in terms of people buying books, and now has started using AI to give them recommendations. So as soon as you buy something, the AI engine understands your preferences based on your history of data, plus they actually understand your browsing habits, and they're able to recommend to you things you may want to buy. And what it does is, it makes it easy for you to buy. So suddenly you think, instead of going to a typical brick and mortar store or go to some other website, it's so much more easier for me to go to Amazon app, search for Sting and buy it. And that's exactly what they've done. They've used data science AI to make it easier for you to buy stuff, which is the interesting part of it. The second more interesting part, and I'll, I'll close it there before I open up questions is, Amazon Go. How many of you have heard of Amazon Go or even seen it? So exactly, it's, it's, it's a pretty impressive number here. So Amazon Go is what would be the future. And, and people may think it's good, it's bad. But what it's doing is, so you enter a store, it automatically knows who you are. You go in, you pick up stuff, and there are hundreds of cameras in the store with the element of uh, deep neural data processing, which understands what products you have picked up, and you just exit the store without doing anything. And your Amazon.com account is, let's say, debited. It looks very, very simple in practice. And, and what it means is, as a customer, I'm getting a service which makes it very quick and easy without wasting time, and even buying a product that I want to buy without having to stand in a till waiting to pay. So that's the way Amazon Go is transforming. And that's where I think more and more of data science, IoT, and AI is going to move us towards in terms of making things easy for customers 
for people who don't want technology, yes, there are the typical brick and mortar stores anyhow. So that's the balance we have here. So future is going to be very different in terms of how AI is enabling these companies. And I think um, uh, that's where we see more and more of uh, uh, the future heading towards. So that's uh, the last slide from my side. Uh, and open up for any questions you may have here. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Great session. Uh, I am going to throw uh, some questions out to the audience in a, in a while, so there will be a microphone coming around. But before then, I'm just going to take a few that I've got here. Um, but if you do have a question, put your hand up in a second. Um, I just want to go back to the last point you were making about Amazon Go. And um, while it's um, great in so many ways, there's lots of people who might think, well, what about privacy and what about data? You know, I don't want people knowing what I'm going and buying and when I'm buying it. Um, so is that something that's going to stop people from shopping in those kind of stores? Or am I being naive because everyone already knows what I'm buying? No, no, you're, you're right. Scott has raised a great point. And this is pretty much what every customer, and Jesse and Campbell agree, every customer talks about. It's all about data privacy, regulations. And, and you'll not believe it, the amount of fines these companies can get if they breach these regulations can run into hundreds of millions. So, so we are talking of almost 5% of the revenues can be in fine, which is huge, right? Thinking of these companies that are in hundreds of millions of dollars, there could be a $5 billion fine. So what's happening here, here is two or three things. One is, uh, it's a mixed bag. So, so there are two or three strategies these companies are employing. They are initially trialing out things in specific states where the regulations are slightly easier, specifically in the US where we don't have GDPR. Slightly more easier because they don't have a big risk of a big fine coming in. The second is for every customer that they have, there's element of uh, uh, a particular uh, consent that is asked for in terms of are you willing to share your data and so on and so forth. And there are, there are individuals and I think it's the millennials who, it all depends, but there are people who want efficiency, quickness and speed and are willing to accept some of these uh, 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 criteria where you can actually share data. And maybe I'm one of them, I don't really care to a large extent if it's a company I trust and so on. And that's where the trust element comes to play, uh, that they can share my data if it means that my checkouts will be faster, my recommendations will be interesting and so on and so forth. But then you're right, there are a set of individuals who still wouldn't want their data to be shared at all. So, so free of the people I know don't even use a normal browser. They always use a Tor browser. There are people like that who don't have a WhatsApp profile photo, don't have a Facebook photo, LinkedIn photo. For those individuals, yes, if they don't consent, that data cannot be shared. And that's, that's where we are moving something called an ethical AI as well, where there's element of ensuring privacy and regulations, plus around building the algorithm in a way that it is ethical as well. So the, it's, it's a big topic altogether. I don't think we have solved the problem. Scott, you're completely right. And there's a big stream of work where we are working with ethical AI and data privacy and regulations, which hopefully will slowly enable us to give a particular framework to then make these things become more mainstream. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to go to the most, uh, the most popular question we've had uh, coming in on Slido. Do you feel that gentrification impacts the strategy for many traditional brick and mortar retailers? And if it does, then does this enable companies to invest in newer technologies? Uh, can you repeat that again? Yeah, sure. It's about the gentrification of like the high street. There's lots of talk in the UK, especially about you know the impact on on high streets and uh, retail. Um, but if there if there's gentrification of those high streets, so more money coming in, does that mean that they can then invest in newer technology? Yeah. So 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 two things, right? So one is we think technology will suddenly take away jobs. Suddenly it'll uh, make things that used to happen before no more happen. So that is the initial argument we all had, right? But if you think of the last 100 years, and I'll talk about uh, uh, something that is real, and, and this is because uh, we did enough research on that. Around 50 years back, uh, what was a typical mode of transportation, do you think? If you had to travel from one place to another place, and there was no car at that time, what, what used to happen 50 years back? Cycling. Exactly. So it was cycling, it was horse carts. So, so around 50, 60 years back, horse cart was a traditional way in which people used to commute. So if I have to, from my 
uh, uh, home in Connecticut, go to let's say Manhattan, there was a horse cart to travel in. And you can't even believe that ha used to happen, right? But what happened is in two or three years, suddenly that entire landscape changed and it became cars. And when it's cars, you don't need a specific driver to drive the horse cart. You don't even need a horse and so on and so forth. So what people thought is suddenly people will lose jobs. Uh, there'll be a big depression in the economy because automation, which is what uh, a motor car was, will transform, but it did not happen. What it meant is uh, the economy still grew. People learned new skills and new type of industry started developing around the motor car engine and motor car and so on and so forth. So on a similar note, uh, what is happening with uh, digitalization is more and more companies are doing something called changing their business model. And that's where we spoke initially, and I think it's a good question here. We spoke about defensive strategies, right? So a so lot of these large organizations are looking at how do I now adopt these new technologies to give a mix of digital and physical. So what people have realized is uh, purely digital may not be what a customer wants. They would still want to go someplace, may not be to really buy something, but maybe to socialize, to engage, to let's say experiment. And I'll give you an example. This is actually related to Alibaba again. So if you actually are in China, so what Alibaba has done is it's transformed the way people buy cars. So there are big booths out there where you can go, select a car you want, and it'll give you every specification you can think of and tell, ask you when you want to test drive it, it'll come to your house or wherever you want, the day you want it, you can test drive it, and with a click of a button, you can buy that car as well. So, so what I'm saying is, it'll be a mix of digital and physical, and, and that balance is where uh, the companies will actually succeed in terms of getting the best customers in and, and growing as well. Okay, great. I think we've just got about a minute left or we can squeeze a question in. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes, question over here, just one second. If you can just start by just saying your name, please, at the beginning. Hi there, I'm Alex. Um, thanks for that talk, it's really interesting. Um, what do you see the impact um, being on the retail experience in terms of customer service? And do, you, do you see there being a reaction to this technology in terms of customer service representatives being more knowledgeable and on, on, the, on their products and the quality of service increasing in reaction to this technology? Fantastic question. Actually, Alex has bought a great question and I, I did not think I covered that in a big way. So what Alex is talking about is how is now technology going to enable human beings, right? So initially when AI came in, people thought AI will replace human beings and that's what we spoke a lot about. But now what we are doing is we are looking at AI as more as augmented intelligence. So it's no more that artificial intelligence that's like an oracle who sits somewhere, but it's augmented intelligence. So what, what AI surely, as Alex you said, is rightly doing is enabling, let's say, the customer service uh, representatives with data, knowledge, information to make a richer conversation with the customer. So when a customer, let's say, comes in, uh, the AI will enable the customer app to understand what this particular customer is looking for and give him more personalized and more knowledgeable answers. So that's exactly what AI is doing uh, in the retail sector. And that's, I think, a big value add for sure. OK, I'm sorry. We're going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. Uh, but everybody, please, thank you, Sunil. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, London. Just take that. Thank you, Sunil. It's brilliant.